groups of European patent attorneys in Europe and we handle patent applications across all subject matter areas. I'm in our chemistry and pharmaceuticals team. Um, I've been there for uh, nearly 15 years now I'm working in that space and helping clients um, around the world really get patents and patent protection in Europe um, but also helping them make more strategic um, decisions like uh, what to do about freedom to operate how to deal with third-party patents that are causing you a problem and so on and so forth um, also within J.A. Kemp we have teams um, a biotech team that deals specifically with biotech um, subject matter and they are probably the largest group of specialists in that area in Europe at the moment they've got something like um, 40 attorneys um, nearly all of which have PhDs so we've got a huge amount of experience there um, and it's interesting that you uh, you had a webinar last week thinking about US practice because I think some of the aspects of European practice we're going to come on to are are really quite different from what's done in the US. So it's, it's useful to, to sort of think about the fact that you should have different strategies for different countries, much as of course, things in India can also be different. So you need to do things uh, specifically for India as well. So um, I'm looking forward to going over some of those points over the next hour or so. Fantastic, absolutely. I was thinking of keeping uh, the two uh, points uh, on the prosecution separately, but I think, uh, uh, from a coverage standpoint, a lot of these points may overlap. And therefore, I was uh, thinking, why don't we start apart uh, from an office action standpoint when sort of you get an office action, what kind of parameters do you look into it uh, while responding back on issues of inventive step or objections on sub subject matter eligibility or even on uh, uh, you know the support that you require from the specification because Europe's known to be very uh, strict on that front. So those aspects versus the claim amendments being done to overcome uh, the cited issues. Could you sort of throw a light on the whole prosecution gamut? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, I think the thing with European practice is that much of what we do is very similar to what is done um, in other countries. So, for example, our standards on novelty are very similar to the standards that other patent offices apply. Um, likewise, on sufficiency, um, it is quite a similar standard across the world, I think, and Europe isn't particularly different there. Um, I won't go too much into subject matter eligibility, primarily because we don't actually have a big issue with that in Europe at the moment. Provided you use the right type of claim language, most subject matter is patent eligible. And in that respect, we're in a much better position um, than the US at the moment. And I expect you probably touched upon this last week. I mean, there are some big problems there at the moment about what actually is patentable. Um, we just don't have that as an issue in Europe at the moment. And hopefully it will stay that way because it, it's clearly not a very satisfactory position in the US. Um, there are two uh, specific areas, though, where I think it's very important to, to get your European strategy right. Um, the first of those is inventive step um, because of the particular approach the EPO takes to inventive step. And the second is um, support for amendments. So you've probably come across the fact that the European Patent Office is very strict on what they term added matter when you make amendments. Um, so I was going to cover both of those topics um, separately. Um, I've got a few slides on each with some practical examples of, of what's going on. So I'm just going to try and share those and I will deal with inventive step first and then we can move on, on to added matter. And um, of course, as Taryn said earlier, if there are any um, questions, um, please do uh, ask them. Right, so hopefully I'm sharing these slides now. Yeah. So as I said, I, I was going to look at inventive step first. Now. The, the, the law in Europe is in Article 56 at EPC, and you'll see it up on the slide there, but it basically just says you have an inventive step if your invention isn't obvious, which doesn't really help you work out what you actually need to do to show that your invention isn't obvious. And you may well have heard of this um, approach that EPO has adapted over the last 30 years or so, which is known as the problem hyphen solution approach. Um, and the next slide really sets out what is meant by this problem and solution approach and it involves three separate steps the first of which is to identify the closest prior art you then establish what the objective technical problem you solve is in view of the closest prior art and then finally you consider starting from the closest prior art and with the aim of solving that objective technical problem whether the claimed invention would have been obvious now I won't go through each of the bullet points I, I have up there um, to explain exactly what is done, but I'll pull out a few points that are, 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 
are important to think about. The first is in relation to actually determining the closest prior art in the first place. Now, the point I would make here is that the EPO generally looks for a document that is concerned with the same function. Um, so in the chemical, uh, in the small molecule space, if you have a compound that your invention is a beta agonist, the EPO will be looking for prior art that is beta agonists. Um, only once they've looked at documents that are beta agonists will they then consider whether the structure of the compounds is similar. So they wouldn't immediately go to a document that's just about compounds with the same structure. Um, the second point on, on objective technical problem I would make is that um, in determining this, what the EPO do is they look at the difference between you and what has been decided to be the closest prior art, and they work out whether there's any technical effect associated with that difference. Um, now, often that technical effect will be demonstrated using comparative data. You will show that your compounds are better than the prior art. And if you can show that you're better in the prior, than the prior art, then the objective technical problem you solve will be achieving that better effect. If you can't show any effect over the prior art, then you'll just be considered an alternative to the prior art. And when you come on to step three, it's much easier to demonstrate an inventive step if you are an improvement over the prior art rather than merely an alternative. So comparative data is highly important in this um, regard. And why is this important? Well, it's important because the EPO are very rigid in using this approach at all stages of prosecution. Now we know from experience of the EPO that examiners actually um, are required to set up a proper problem and solution analysis when they ask their superior if they can grant an application. So if you've given them a problem and solution analysis that they can cut and paste into their internal report, it makes their job easier and they're more likely to grant your patent. Um, similarly, during opposition and appeals, the tribunals there get very irritated if you don't use the problem and solution approach. They ask you to do it and if you go off and do something differently, then they are very unsympathetic and will often find against you. So my point is, is that the, the ingredient of success here at the EPO is to do what they want and help them to give you what you want. Um, and I promised a sort of practical example and I, I, you'll see on your screen you have a, a series of, of concentric circles which are supposed to represent some um, different areas of prior art and I'm just going to try over the next couple of minutes explain how the problem and solution approach would work in this particular um, scenario. So if, imagine we have a group of novel compounds that's the red circle here which are um, active against a particular disease X and within that, we have a lead compound, which is this very small uh, gray circle here. So that is our invention there. Suppose we have um, a series of different prior arts available. Um, there are four. I've put them down as A, B, C and D. And we'll go through each of those in turn and work out how you might argue an inventive step from that, that particular piece of prior art. So the first one is prior art A. That's this dark one. So this is structurally rather different compounds because it's a long way away from A but for treating the same disease X. Now, there's a decent chance that the EPO might consider this a closest prior art option because it is, um, because it is concerned with treating the same disease. However, the compounds are so structurally different that you might well be able to argue, even if you're only an alternative, as in you don't have any comparative data showing you're better, that it is a non-obvious alternative because the difference in structure is so great. Um, but you would still want to set up your inventive step uh, arguments in a problem and solution analysis and explain why you are a non-obvious alternative um, in that uh, uh, scenario. What's going to be a bit trickier is if we get on to invention B. Now invention B is this, this blue, pale blue circle here and that you see is much closer structurally to our invention. Now there, if we are only an alternative in the objective technical problem, it's going to be much more difficult to argue that we are inventive because the compounds are so structurally similar. So what we would want to do there is have some comparative data showing that our compounds are better um, than those of prior art B, and then we can um, formulate our objective technical problem as, as uh, achieving that advantage over the prior art, um, that improvement, and then it will be much easier for us to argue for inventive step. The third option here is um, option C. Now this is this small circle um, between next to the red circle and that represents um, some very similar structurally uh, compounds, but ones which have a completely different activity. 
Now, the EPO generally wouldn't consider that document to represent a credible closest prior art. And normally, if the examiner raised that as the closest prior art, my response would be to say, no, this isn't the closest prior art. It's to do with uh, completely different activity, and it's not a credible starting point for consideration of inventive step. Also, if the examiner tried to bring it in as a secondary document, so he tried to combine document C with document B, um, for example, you could say, well, no, a skilled person seeking to cure disease X wouldn't be looking at document C in the first place because it's to do with such different compounds. So it should be fairly easy using the problem and solution analysis to disregard document C, despite the fact it's structurally very similar to, um, to, to the claimed compounds. The final one I'd come down to is um, uh, this very broad circle here, this yellow um, group. So this is a disclosure, a very general disclosure in the prior art of a, a, a Markush formula of compounds for treating disease X. Now it's much broader than what we're claiming and under EPO practice we may well be a novel selection over that, that broad disclosure. But the question is are we inventive? Now to, to establish inventive step in this scenario, we would almost certainly need some form of comparative data to show that our selection was purposive and that there was some un, unexpected advantage associated uh, with working in that red area as compared to the broader disclosure in the prior art. So in that instance, our objective technical problem would be achieving that advantage. And again, uh, we might have a decent chance of establishing inventive step. On the other hand, if we've got no um, advantage shown with comparative data and we're merely an alternative, then we will almost certainly lack an inventive step just because it would be obvious to work within that red area um, within, within the broader yellow area. So I know it's quite hard to sort of picture this um, you, you, with these sort of uh, the circles, but um, when you actually come along to a practical example of this, hopefully this, this approach will start to make some more sense and you'll be able to apply it um, to, to your cases to work out exactly the best way to argue for inventive step at, at the European Patent Office. Um, now that's a kind of very EPO way of looking at inventive step. Another thing the EPO does in a, a very sort of EPO way is, is adding matter. And I think this is a, a something that causes applicants throughout the world uh, big problems. And basically, there are two types of amendment that can cause you problems at the EPO. Um, the first is where you put in an undisclosed limitation in the claims. The second is where you make a, an undisclosed generalization of what you originally disclosed. And both types of amendment can arise either where you have no literal disclosure of the amendment you want to make, but also more confusingly where you do have literal disclosure of that, that feature, but maybe not in quite the right place. And I'll explain with a few examples over the coming slides um, how those different types of problem can arise. So the first real issue that we notice quite a lot, particularly, um, I have to say, uh, with applications originating from the United States of America, is that um, applicants uh, try and tidy up their claims um, to make them say what they would have wanted them to say. So the example I've put up on the slide here is where you have original language in a method claim saying adding X to Y to make Z. And um, you try and amend that in Europe to say reacting X with Y to make Z. Now, in many jurisdictions, that would be absolutely fine. Probably in India, that would be fine, in my experience. Certainly in the US, almost certainly fine. But the EPA will say, well, do these mean exactly the same thing? If yes, you don't need to make any amendments. And if no, there's some sort of uh, change in claim scope here, which isn't disclosed in your application, so you can't make the amendment. And it's not relevant here whether it would be obvious to replace adding with reacting. The question is, you know, is there a difference in claim scope? What is actually disclosed in the application as filed? And whether you have basis for this new wording? And unless the word reacting appears in that context in the application as filed, you probably wouldn't be able to make this amendment. So what I would say here is, is resist the urge at the EPO to tweak the claims to make them say what you want to might want them to say in an ideal world don't tidy the claims up unless you necessarily have to for some reason another very epo issue that many of you may have come across um, is this idea of uh, selections from multiple lists so this is another position where um, people can often run into difficulties and to illustrate this i've put up an example on the slide here where we have a composition which contains two components a solvent and a thickening agent 
Now, assume that we come up with some prior art during examination, which means that that lacks novelty and we want to put in um, additional uh, definitions of solvent and thickening agent into the claims to, uh, to distinguish ourselves from the prior art. Um, we can probably do that, but the, the problem might arise if we want to make selections from lists when we do it. So the example I have here is where we have a list of suitable solvents, but for some reason we want to pick ethanol from that list. Similarly, we have a list of uh, suitable thickening agents, but we want to pick methyl cellulose from that list. So the claim we end up is composition comprising ethanol and methyl cellulose. Now, the words in your claim are in the application as filed. So you might think it's going to be OK from an added matter perspective. But unfortunately, the way the EPO looks at this, it won't be. They will probably say that these um, represent uh, selections from independent lists. And consequently, by putting them together in that way, you are uh, generating new subject matter that is not disclosed unambiguously in the application as originally filed. So I'm not saying it will add matter. There may be occasions where you use those two um, uh, components in the example. So you can argue that, in fact, there is no selection. You're just focusing in on the core of the invention. But it's something to be aware of that merely the fact that you have the words in the application as filed doesn't necessarily mean you can put them into your claim without running into problems on added matter. A third example of where you can run into problems is where you try and remove a feature from a claim. So in this example, I've got a dispersion comprising components A, B and C. Um, say I realize after filing that in fact component C isn't necessary and I want to broaden my claim out, can I just remove component C? Well, in many jurisdictions, you probably could, um, but the EPO uh, apply a three-part test to determine whether you can just remove feature C. And that test involves looking firstly at whether that feature is explained as being essential in the application. If it is described as essential, then you probably won't be able to remove it. Um, they will also then consider whether that feature is essential, essential for achieving the function of the invention. So that will be quite fact specific, as you might imagine. And finally, they'll consider whether its removal requires you to modify other features of the claim to make up for that, that omission. And again, that's quite fact specific. So the, the problem you come to here is, is that it will be quite difficult to determine in, in advance whether you can make that type of amendment. And you may well end up having quite a big um, discussion with the EPO about whether it's acceptable. And um, Ultimately, uh, it's quite hard to make this type of amendment in my experience without being found to add subject matter. The final example I'm going to talk about is, is what the EPO calls an intermediate generalization. And this is a very classic EPO added matter objection. And it's quite a hard one for people to, to uh, grasp what is meant, primarily because it, um, it has a rather unhelpful name that doesn't really describe what's going on. What in fact the situation is here is where you're trying to limit the claims um, by introducing a feature, but the feature you're wanting to introduce needs to be extracted from a specific embodiment. So you end up with an intermediate scope between the, the, the narrowest embodiment and where you started. And if I can just give an example here. Um, so if you have a, a feature, a claim which, with two features A and B, and you have a second claim, claim two with features A, B, C and D, if you try and amend claim one just to introduce feature C and point to claim two as your basis, the EPO will almost certainly say, no, this is an intermediate generalization. Features C and D are together in claim two. So by just taking feature C on its own, you're cre creating an intermediate generalization um, and that's unallowable. Um, so that objection arises quite a lot. And the most common place it actually arises is where you try and extract a feature in isolation from a worked example. So, for example, if you're claiming a process and you want to introduce a temperature and you don't have basis in the general description for any temperatures, but you want to introduce the temperatures that were used in your worked examples, um, the EPO may well say, no, you can't introduce that temperature on its own. You also need to introduce other uh, features of the, of the claim of the example in order to, to not add matter. And you might think, well, why, why does all of this matter? I mean, if the EPO accepts my amendment, surely it's going to be fine. Well, it, there is a big risk here, which I think it's worth bearing in mind all along, is even if you persuade the EPO um, at first instance that it's acceptable to make an amendment, you could run into troubles after your patent's granted. And that's because um, under Article 123.3 EPC, you can't extend the scope of protection after grant. Um, and what 
can happen and cause big problems is the sort of scenario I've got up here on the slide. So this is the earlier example I talked about um, regarding selections from, from lists. So um, remember I said that if you picked um, ethanol and methyl cellulose um, and put those into your claim, you, you might get an added matter objection. But say you didn't get an added matter objection or you successfully argue that that objection was, was incorrect. That's good, your patent's granted, but suddenly some decos and files an opposition against you and the opposition division disagree. They think your um, amendment adds subject matter. Well, you can't remove those features without broadening the scope of the claim, but you can't keep them in because they contravene Article 1232. In effect, you end up in an inescapable trap and your patent will be um, fundamentally invalid. Um, so that's the thing you need to think about when you're making amendments during prosecution is what might happen if this is granted with those features in, but an opposition division disagrees that they have basis. Which I think brings me to the end of that that section. So I will stop um, sharing for now. And um, I don't know if there's any questions or um, that we can cover at this point on some of those topics. So Chris, uh, there was an example of ABCD. There's a question there on the chat about that. Can you just go back perhaps the first slide? Can you just go back to your slide for one second? Yeah. There was a slide on, there was a, uh, there were the, the, con the concentric circle uh, slide. Was it this one? Uh, no, the concentric circles one, the first one or the second one, I think. Was it this one, removal of a feature? No, the first one, I think. The first one where there were circles uh, shown, the concentric circles. Maybe the second slide it was, yeah. Chris, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. So it was about, um, so the uh, chat uh, asked, there was a question by Madhusudan. I can't see the question now, but it was, uh, is Madhusudan, can you ask your question that you had on this uh, slide? So I think he'll come back maybe during the next set of questions. So Chris, uh, uh, how is the, Okay. Uh, what's the status on the examination on the hearing that happened with the examiners? Because we take a big advantage of the hearings of the examiner interviews that take place in the U.S. and um, feel that you know equal flexibility is not available at the at the EPO for an applicant to be able to sort of go ahead and participate uh, uh, in mm -hmm. the opportunity. So, could you throw some light on that front? How you can get the hearing structured? Yes, so certainly I can. That's that's fine. Um, so the, the general way the EPO works with hearings um, is that they are seen as the, um, the last uh, resort during examination and you only have a hearing essentially if the um, examiner is minded to refuse your application. So it's seen as a way of um, drawing proceedings to a close. So in that respect, they are slightly different from the US situation where people often um, arrange examiner interviews quite early in execution to try and um, get examiner on their side. So the EPO formal hearings are, are very different from the from the US um, uh, system. H having said that, um, there is an increasing um, ability um, in, um, in Europe to actually um, ask examiners for informal interviews earlier in examination. And examiners are being um, encouraged by the EPO um, to, uh, to, to actually engage with that and um, try and um, uh, help applicants out. So it, it doesn't happen very often at the moment, um, but particularly with video conferencing becoming more and more ubiquitous, 
I think there will be a bigger place for those examiner interviews earlier in the procedure in Europe than, than was the case previously. So um, you may want to think about it as an option. Um, having said that, my overall feeling is generally so um, it's a very written procedure. So your best bet is to file a strong written response initially, see how the examiner reacts, and then think about whether you could benefit from trying to speak to the examiner about a particular point. I see one more follow-up question was also about the data, the clinical, the experimental data that we submit, uh, uh, maybe in the form of their declarations in the US. How is EPO reacting to it? Because obviously that data has not been submitted earlier up in the patent application and it's sort of uh, only during or post the filing that the data has sort of become available to substantiate the efficacy or uh, the synergistic effect or whatever the intended objective might be. How would you, uh, how much of reliance would you place on that while arguing for the inventive step uh, argument? Yeah, so I mean, historically at the EPO, they were very relaxed about allowing you to use data generated after the filing date. Um, we were quite like the position currently is in the US in that you could generally use any data that was available to support your position. Um, the EPO has got stricter over the last few years. You can only rely on data generated after the filing date. The effect that that data shows made um, at least plausible by what you have in the application uh, as originally filed. Um, so what this generally means is that if you're um, finding extra comparative data which relates to the same advantage as was as mentioned and supported in the application as filed, then the EPA will generally take extra data into account. On the other hand, if you um, file data that shows that you get some brilliant advantage that isn't foreshadowed in any way in the application as filed, there is a good chance that the EPA will say no, um, that the, the advantage that this data shows isn't plausible from the application as filed and therefore you cannot rely upon it to support your position. On so we're, we're, it's a slightly more difficult situation now than it used to be. Um, the other thing I would say is that there's no requirement at the EPO to file your data in the form of declarations as, as in the US. So a simple experimental report um, setting out the results will usually be enough. So that makes things a bit cheaper and easier generally at, in Europe. Sure. So coming back to the questions uh, uh, from uh, the attendees, uh, Madhusudan is asking about that slide, uh, point number C, uh, that was there in the, uh, the, uh, you know, the slide that we were referring to whether C is talking about new use of structurally similar compounds. So he just wanted to have clarity on whether C is talking about new use of structurally similar compounds there. Um, so prior art C would be, um, that's a, a disclosure of a compound, say for treating disease Y, so a different disease from disease X. So the reason I, I mentioned that is because that, represents the structurally most similar compounds to what we're now claiming but it because it's to do with a different disease the EPA will generally disregard it um, for inventive step on the other hand if, if you imagine that that disclosure was within my red circle there then that would destroy the novelty of a claim to a compound per se but uh, in Europe I could claim the use, um, those compounds for use in treating disease X. And that would then again be novel because that disclosure um, of the purple compounds is for treating disease Y. So there is um, a, an ability there to, um, to distinguish yourself from that disclosure um, in view of the use if it actually falls, if, if the compounds are the same. Um, but in the example I gave here, the compounds are just very similar, not the same. Um, in, um uh, there's another question from Raj Kumar where he says that when we submit third party observations during the patent uh, prosecution and is there any particular timeline for an applicant to submit those or uh, uh, or, or is there a, a more recommended timeline that you should sort of ideally do it before the examination uh, first examination report is issued out or or uh, 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 what's the timeline on about? Um, so the EPA will accept third party observations uh, at any point after part of the application up until it is uh, granted. Um, so you've got a lot of flexibility there to file your third party observations. Um, generally, it's best to file them at the point where they're going to um, have most effect on what the examiner does. So I would normally say that if the applicant has filed a response to some objections and you can see that 
it's what they've said is wrong or you have some new prior art, the best time to file your third party observations would be shortly after the applicant's response so that when the examiner next picks up the case, he can see your third party observations and base his next examination report on what you have argued. The other thing I would say is, is that the, the, the later you file your observations in the overall procedure, the less effect they will have. Um, so it's good to file them early. The reason for that is, is that examiners get points for granting applications. Um, and if they, <laughs> To put it bluntly, um, it's in their interest to grant applications to get their points. So if they've gone all the way through examination and have decided something's allowable and only at that point do you raise some third party observations, they may be less inclined to take them um, seriously um, because of the late stage than they would have been had you filed them a year earlier, right at the beginning of the examination. All right. Uh, one final question before we move on to freedom to operate uh, mandates. Uh, was it on the fact that in the specification, instead of giving a list of compounds, uh, is it better to give specific compositions? That's the first part. And uh, in Markush uh, structure explanation, can we claim specific structures if examples are not there? Um, so this is in relation primarily to added matter. I mean, I think um, the best thing to do with um, when drafting an application to, to maximize your um, success on, on ad, against added matter objections is to claim a, a Marcus formula in claim one that embraces all of the compounds you've made and then have a series of what we would call fallback positions that go narrower onto the specific compounds you've made until in your narrowest embodiment you have list of those compounds and if you do it that way you have the maximum ability to make amendments to address prior art that comes up um, in relation to whether you can claim a Marcus formula if you don't have any compounds within it um, well you could but many examiners will say well this is unsupported so they might then raise um, a sufficiency or support objection to that claim because there are no exemplified compounds falling within the scope of that of that claim all right, uh, Hethvi, uh, you had another question. Go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. So uh, my question is from your one of your slide, which has mentioned about suitable solvents. Uh, can can we switch on to that slide, please? Yeah. So uh, your uh, in the claim you have mentioned few solvents like ethanol, propanol, acetone, etc. And in amendment, you are specifying. So why are we specifying those solvents and um, thickening agents? Um, well, I suppose in this example, if the prior art disclosed um, propanol as the solvent and hydroxyethyl cellulose as a thickening agent, you might want to focus on ethanol and methyl cellulose in order to get around that piece of prior art. <laughs> So if you try to make that amendment, the EPO might say that each of those is a selection. Um, obviously, if there was uh, no uh, disclosure of those solvents in the prior art, propanol or, or hydroxyethyl cellulose, you could just put the three, the four solvents in and not make any selection and the two thickening agents in and not make a selection. So what the amendments you make will always be driven, I, I guess, by the prior art more often than not. So um, in this scenario, it would have been better had we had an additional disclosure saying, for example, preferably the solvent is ethanol and preferably the thickening agent is methyl cellulose, because once they're pulled out of the list in that way, it's OK to make an amendment to combine them. Thank you. One more thing to ask. Uh, I think in the first, very first slide, you have mentioned a... a you are adding X and Y to make uh, Z, right? And in amendment, you have said X is reacting with Y to make Z, correct? So um, if you are saying reacting, then isn't it a broad view? I mean, reacting means it can be any reaction. And here in adding, there is a specific. So why are we making their amendment? Um, that's a good question. I don't know why someone would make that amendment, but often in my experience, people from, particularly from the USA, like to make the claims read as they want to read them. Um, so the point I was making here is that if they have a difference in meaning, and I think they probably do, as you've just said, um, then um, by making that amendment, you are changing the scope of the claims and then you're running into the risk of, of, of uh, 
uh, of an added matter issue at the EPO. So you just, I think the point I'm trying to make is before you make any amendment, be very careful and think about, well, do I need to make this? And if I do make it, will it cause me problems in the future? Thank you. No problem. So, uh, Chris, uh, uh, switching gears from prosecution to FTOs, uh, can you throw some light? Because we were, a lot of our clients, uh, uh, when they talk about an FTO opinion, obviously it's not just the EPO, right? I mean, a lot of it is uh, national patents in countries where the databases are not very friendly. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, when they need a Europe-wide uh, uh, opinion from a freedom to operate standpoint, they would really want to expect uh, that we investigate all the Italian patents, which never would have been filed at CPO. So how would you go about an FTO and perhaps some key parameters that uh, you guys keep in mind? Yeah, um, I've got a few slides on this, but uh, they may not be particularly helpful. So I'll, I'll just talk about that first point first, because it is an interesting one. Um, and then maybe we can look at some parameters with reference to the slides afterwards. Um, you're quite right that one of the difficulties with dealing with freedom to operate in Europe is that um, you're dealing with lots and lots of different countries, um, many of which will have uh, patent office registers that are either not available online or are incomplete or are um, in a language that you can't understand. Um, so it, it is difficult. Um, what I would normally suggest to most of my clients is um, try and work out what the picture is for the UK, France and Germany first. The reason for that is that those are the biggest markets and there aren't too many um, companies that pursue patent protection outside those countries um, without also pursuing it in France, Germany and the UK. So if you work out that you're clear in the UK, France and Germany, um, and there's another country you're interested in, you can then go and check that country specifically. By contrast, if you work out that there are some problems in France, Germany, and the UK, a particular pattern, you can also then go and look um, in, in the country of interest, say it's Poland, for example, and see if that pattern exists there in any form. So in effect, what I'm saying is it's, it's sometimes best, rather than trying to look at every country at once, to do a more iterative approach and do something that's fairly easy to do first, i.e. looking at the three biggest economies in Europe, working out your position there and then applying what you have learned from that analysis to each of the other countries where you might be wanting to launch a product. Does that help? Sure, sure Chris, absolutely. Yeah, I mean it's what I was going to say generally about freedom to operate is I think it's um, one of these difficult um, topics because you can spend a huge amount of money doing freedom to operate searching um, and conclude and come back with conclusions that aren't particularly helpful or useful to you having spent all of that money. So actually what it's often better to do is to do an iterative approach where you um, progressively look further and further into what it is you're going to be doing with your product. So, um, I think that's what I was the point I was trying to make on this this first slide here is well when say you're trying to look at FTO for a new compound when, when should you actually go away and, and look for uh, uh, into FTO well there are lots of different times you could do it and the question of when you do it well there probably isn't a correct answer so say you um, do an initial screen of, of lots of compounds and work out that a particular um, set of compounds may be active and you're going to investigate them further should you do FTO then well you could do but you don't really know what it is you're looking for yet so it's probably going to be a bit difficult um, you could do it slightly further down the, the line when you've worked out what the, an important core structure is um, but again there may be lots of compounds within that core structure so it's going to be difficult um, should you do it once you've selected a particular candidate that you're actually going to take to the market? Well, that's the best time to do it in certain respects. But equally, if you then find out there are lots of FTO problems with that particular compound, had you done the search earlier, you might have gone down a different route and picked one of the other um, uh, potential compounds. So there's no right time to do it, really. Um, but whatever you do, it has to be iterative and you have to sort of do it stepwise. And once you've uh, found out the answer to a particular step, then move on to the next step. 
Um, and something we often say to, to our clients is if they're not really ready to do a full FTO on a particular um, compound or, or invention because they perhaps they don't have the money to do it, but they still want to have said to say to um, investors or, or um, uh, partners they're working with that they have done some FTO, you can do limited things without spending too much money. So, for example, if you know um, a competitor is active in a particular field, you could just look up their patents are in a particular area and work out whether there's any freedom to operate issues there. So it's not a comprehensive FTO, but it does give you an idea. Another thing to do is to look um, at the results you have from search reports on your own patent applications, look at those documents and consider when, whether any of those represent a, a freedom to operate problem. So again, it doesn't really give you full freedom to operate, but it's something you can say to, um, to investors and partners that you have done that may, may help them feel confident that you're a serious company. Um, yeah, and I suppose the other thing to do is, well, what do you search on? And I, I guess this is another sort of tricky question. Well, there's so many different things you could search on. So you could just look around the particular compound you're developing. Um, but should you do a bit more than that? I mean, you could look for pro, if you're going to sell it as a pro drug, you'd need to think about that. Um, if you're selling it as a particular salt form, you'd need to look at that. Do, do, do your, does your compound exist in different tautomeric forms? There's lots of different things you need to, to think about here. Similarly, what form are you going to administer it in? Um, do you need to search around the formulation um, that you're going to be using? Now, each of those will add complexity and cost to FTO. So the simplest thing is basically just to do a structure search around the structure of the particular compound. Um, but you've got to accept that if you do that, there will be some elements of your freedom to operate position that you've not really looked at properly. Um, similarly, making the compound, you know, looking at manufacturing processes is generally you won't know how you're going to make the compound at an early stage. So that's not something you do early on in your FTO procedure, but it is something you want to think about later on when you're gearing up to, to go to market. So you look at the route you're going to use. You might want to look at um, FTO around each of the key synthetic intermediates in that process. And obviously that in itself is quite a big exercise. Um, another thing to think about, which people often forget is um, if the compound you're, you're developing is metabolized um, in the human body to various compounds, um, the generation of those metabolites could potentially represent infringement if those metabolites are claimed in other patents out there. So once you know about the metabolism of your compound, you may want to do a top-up FTO search to look for, for patents that could represent an issue in relation to those, those metabolites. I mean, another point on sort of being pragmatic about these things is, is to sort of think, well, how can I make my search reasonable? So if you know when you're going to hit the market, you've got a rough guess, say it's 2026, then you can put a parameter in your search to only look back 25 years from 2026, i.e. back to 2001. Now, why do I say that? Well, in Europe, patents last for 20 years and there's a possibility of five years of SPC term, supplementary protection certificate term on top of that. So 25 years um, should uh, allow you to find anything that could potentially be relevant. Um, and then where? Um, well, I just said that in Europe, you probably want to be quite pragmatic and maybe just do France, Germany and UK to begin with. Um, but often people will, um, their big market will be the US. So you might even want to do the US first, work out what was relevant there and then apply the intelligence you've got from that to Europe. And regardless of which one of those you do, you, you always need to look for uh, PCT applications because they can be used to cover those countries as well. So these are the sorts of parameters you need to think about when you're setting up your search. And I suppose the last point I wanted to make on, on this is, um, you know, be imaginative when you're working out how you're going to set up your search. So yes, you could just look for the name of a compound, but you also need to think about the fact that Marcus formulae could well embrace that compound. And Importantly, you, you should think about whether there could be functional definitions in patent claims that also embrace your compound. So say your compound is a, a, a PDE4 inhibitor, um, you would need to look at patent claims which uh, use the language PDE4 inhibitor because they might embrace your compound despite the fact that compound isn't disclosed in that patent. So there's a lot of different things to think about. Um, that's probably 
about all I've got time for on FTO, I think, Tao, and I don't know if there are any questions on that. It's a, quite a nebulous topic, so it may be easier to take a few practical questions if there are any. Yes, I think we'll keep parking them for the end, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, we'll just uh, finish up the last mandate and, uh, and then open it up to whatever time it takes for colleagues to ask uh, questions. Uh, so one last topic that we wanted to obviously touch base also was the very active uh, opposition practice that's, that takes place, uh, although the agenda mentions more focus on um, uh, you know, key tips that uh, while you're defending an opposition, but perhaps you could also uh, maybe throw some light on when you're filing an opposition as an opponent, what kind of uh, you know, best practices would you like to follow while you're on, on both sides? Yeah, absolutely. I will do that. Um... Yeah, so just before um, diving into what you would do as an opponent or a patentee in an opposition procedure, just to briefly outline what it's all about. So this isn't third party observations, which happen during uh, the, the pendency of an application. The EPO's opposition procedure happens after grant of the patent and you have a nine month term in which to file an opposition if you wish to do so. Um, At the end, they don't generally get any extensions of time to that, so it, it should be treated as a drop-dead deadline. Once the patentees filed a response, you get a summons to oral proceedings, so that's a hearing at the EPO, and it will include a preliminary opinion from the opposition division about the merits of the case. Um, at that point, you'll set a two-month term um, prior to the oral proceedings for filing any final written submissions you have. Um, regarding the case and following that the hearing will take place and I'll come on to what the hearings like a, a little bit later but essentially at the end of the day um, at the hearing the opposition division will announce uh, a result a result could be that the patent is revoked the, the result could be that the patent is upheld as granted or if amendments have been filed the patent could be upheld in amended form and after the um, hearing several months later a written decision is issued by the EPO in which um, the uh, uh, reasoning is set out and that sets a, a term by, uh, for an appeal to be filed if desired. And I think one thing to point out here is that this is actually now quite a quick procedure. So the EPO is, is aiming to have the oral proceedings to decide whether or not the patent should be revoked within two years of the grant date. So it's now quite a quick procedure. Um, they haven't quite got there. It's more like two and a half years at the moment, but it is going quickly. Um, the appeal that happens afterwards is a lot slower. I think a little bit like your IPAB in, in India, um, appeals do take a long time in Europe at the moment. It's something like three to five years. But nevertheless, um, it, it's, it's getting better, I think, and they are trying hard to do that. So I promised to talk about what you would do if you're attacking, what you do if you're defending. Let's think about attacking first, because it's what you would um, do first procedurally. So if you're attacking a patent, what can you attack it for? Well, Clearly, you could attack for lack of novelty or lack of inventive step based on prior art. You could um, argue that the patent is in, uh, the invention is insufficiently disclosed. Um, as we went through earlier in the webinar, um, added matter is a big issue. So if you can spot amendments that have been made that add subject matter, you can raise that. And finally, though it's not such a big issue in Europe, it's always worth thinking about whether the patentee has claimed unpatentable subject matter. Um, for example, a method of surgery um, or a method of treatment um, in a way that's inappropriate and can be attacked. On the subject of added matter, if you're thinking of opposing a patent, it is always worth trying to run an added matter attack in relation to any amendments have been made. Um, the reason for this is it's often hard to know in advance whether or not those attacks will work. Um, and sometimes ones that you don't expect to work do. And once an added matter attack is working, it's quite hard for the patentee to deal with it sometimes. They might end up, for example, in that inescapable trap I mentioned on an earlier slide. Um, Insufficiency, by contrast, is, is quite a hard thing to run as an opponent. That's basically because you have to provide a lot of evidence um, so that you have serious doubts substantiated by verifiable facts to, to support your position. And in practice, that's quite hard for opponents to do. But nevertheless, it's something worth thinking about, particularly if there are medical use claims in the patent, which can be um, rather more vulnerable to sufficiency attacks because you need to show that the therapeutic effect um, specified in the claim is actually achieved. 
So what should you include in your opposition statement? Well, my recommendation would be to include an attack under each ground. So a novelty and inventive step sufficiency and added matter if you possibly can. You may accept that some of your attacks aren't weak, a little bit weak, but once you've got an attack in under a particular ground, it's easier to add new attacks under that ground in the future. Having said that, it's important, I think, to focus on your strongest attacks um, subsequently in the procedure. So be prepared to drop attacks that aren't good and put your main uh, focus on your best attacks. Um, another point to say here is, is that you should include all of your prior art that you want to rely on from the outset. It's hard now to add new prior art later. So if in doubt, include something that you may want to rely upon later. Finally, on inventive step, uh, make sure you use the problem and solution approach. I explained why this was important earlier and it's vital in, in, in an opposition to use that approach. Otherwise, the opposition division may well disregard many of your attacks. So that's about attacking. What do you do if you're defending? Well, I think the key point here is to say that you don't have much time. The EPO only sets four months term for you to respond and um, there can often be a lot of work involved. So the moment you find out that you've, your patent has been opposed, you should start thinking immediately about how best to respond um, to it and make sure that when you do file a response, it is a complete response and includes everything you might want to rely upon later. And that's because anything you file um, subsequently could be considered a late filed and not admitted into the proceedings. And I think the real thing to think about here is that this is your main chance to, to engage with the opposition division prior to the oral proceedings. And it really is your chance to set your case up as the patentee as well as possible. Um, but having said that, good defence starts in prosecution. Um, all of the issues, um, some of the issues that will be raised in opposition, such as added subject matter and priority entitlement, will um, depend upon amendments you have made during prosecution. So particularly if you think that your patent is um, one that may well be opposed, it's extra important to be careful that you don't make amendments that add subject matter. And also that if it's important that you're entitled to priority, that you don't make um, amendments that lose your priority entitlement. Um, or that may be easier said than done. It's something you should think, be thinking about during prosecution. And also, if you think you're going to be opposed, it may well be worthwhile filing a, a, a precautionary divisional application prior to um, grant of your patent so that you've got some backup in case um, added matter priority issues arise that you can't address properly or on the parent case. So when you're defending your patents against an opposition, is there a particular way to set up your response? I wouldn't say so, really, no. What I would say is, is that you want to um, follow the order in which the opposition division will address the issues. So this normally means added matter first, possibly priority next, then normally novelty, inventive step and sufficiency in that order. So, so try and set it up in a way that will fit with the way the opposition division will consider the case themselves. Um, it's sometimes worth having a, a more general section on, on your invention to try and uh, convince the opposition division that there is a good invention at the heart of your applicate, your patent. That can often, often help matters. Um, the final point I would make here is, is that although it's important to respond to the objections raised by the opponent, don't be sucked into their game and sidetracked by dealing with all of their spurious attacks um, in great detail. Make sure you put a positive case forward about why your patent should be upheld as granted rather than being um, uh, sidetracked into dealing with um, arguments that don't really um, have much merit. That can often dilute your, the strength of your case and, and, and ca can cause you problems in the long term. So that's kind of what you generally do in terms of uh, uh, attacking and defending. But when it comes to the oral proceedings, that's the hearing um, uh, at the end of the proceedings, um, basically the considerations are the same for both parties. And my strong recommendation here is preparation, preparation, preparation. My experience of oppositions is, is that um, the side that uh, knows the documents the best and has has predicted new arguments that the other side may uh, raise is is most likely to get a good outcome i mean obviously in many cases uh, you, you if you've got a very weak case you can't win whatever you do but you, you give yourself the best chance of getting a good outcome if you've prepared well um, and on that topic it's really really helpful to have a technical expert available at the hearing 
So if a technical expert, so an inventor or somebody else um, with a lot of scientific knowledge, won't normally speak at the hearing, but they can provide um, input to the attorney, someone like myself, who isn't a technical expert, to help them um, during the hearing. And this can be particularly important if the other side raise an entirely new argument um, that has never been raised before. And often the technical experts can see why that argument is spurious very quickly indeed, whereas an attorney may take longer because um, we aren't as qualified scientifically as the technical experts. So that, that can be an important um, aspect um, of an oral proceedings. I think the other thing to do is to say that um, these hearings are always unexpected. Um, they never go as you expect. Um, something will always happen that throws you. Um, something will always happen that throws the other side as well. So it, go in expecting to be surprised. Um, when you're at one of these, they're not contentious in that you discuss things with the other side. Rather, you're supposed to um, uh, direct all of your submissions to the opposition division. Um, even if you're responding to what the other side has said, you, you need to direct your response to the opposition division. Um, and the final point I would say is it really is survival of the fittest. I mean, I have done hearings that have started at 9 a.m. in the morning um, uh, at the EPO and haven't finished till 10 or 11 p.m. in the evening. So uh, you need to, yeah, f keep strong, bring some food with you and, and be prepared to, to deal with what is probably the, the technically most complicated um, aspect of the case. That is inventive step right at the end of the day when you're tired and would rather just go home. Um, so that's all I had really on opposition procedure. So I'll stop sharing. And if there's any questions on oppositions or freedom to operate or indeed anything, um, I think we've got a few minutes. We could we could tackle some of those. Absolutely. Uh, fantastic, Chris. Thanks for uh, uh, make, keeping it crisp as well as sort of making sure that all points and uh, uh, best practices are sort of uh, laid out in that sense. So thank you very much on that. Uh, um, I have a couple of questions in the chat before we ask questions. Uh, uh, over over the microphone, I think uh, we'll take those. Uh, uh, EPO, there's a question being asked by Alpha, asking EPO wouldn't object under EP one two three, I think sub clause two, uh, during prosecution. There is a, a one twenty three dash two. Alpha, can you uh, ask that question verbally if possible? I've seen the question. It's yeah. Yeah. So this is the question. EPO won't object under one, two, three. Uh, yeah. So the EPO do object during prosecution under one, two, three, two EPC. So when you file an amendment, the first thing the EPO do is consider whether that amendment complies with one, two, three, two EPC. So that is essentially does that amendment have support in the application as filed? Now. Just because the EPO say that it does during prosecution and grant the patent doesn't mean that an opposition division will agree. So during an opposition, um, you can raise an objection that Article 1232 was not complied with during um, the pre-grant procedure and that an amendment that is present in the patent um, adds subject matter and contravenes 1232. And the fact that the EPO earlier said that it was an okay amendment does not mean that it cannot be objected to under that. Um, under that provision and in fact that does happen fairly regularly particularly um, during oppositions that uh, an amendment that seemed fine suddenly is, is no longer considered okay so that's why it's important to be as careful as you can when making amendments just because of what can happen later. Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, Mohit asks a question on uh, based on your experience is it advisable to oppose at the opposition board uh, level or is it better or is it a better strategy to oppose in individual country courts if the countries of interest of the opponent are minimal? Um, I would say it's almost always much better to file centrally an opposition at the EPO. Um, it's a lot cheaper than any national um, litigation. So even if you are only interested in one country, um, it will still be cheaper in most cases to file a central opposition at the EPO. Um, the other point there is, is that uh, the EPO central opposition is time limited. You've only got nine months to do it. So if you're in doubt, it's a good idea to get your foot in the door so you have an opposition. Whereas you can challenge um, nationally in the before the national courts at any point during the lifetime of a patent. So that option is always available to you. In fact, even if you lose your opposition, you can still launch a national revocation action in a country 
um, and try try again if it if it hasn't worked at opposition. So yeah, definitely file an opposition at the EPO centrally, even if you're only really interested in one country. Uh, we have a question from Meeta who's asking, what are your thoughts on filing uh, two sets of claims through preliminary and subsidiary requests? Um, so you, uh, yeah, so this is the idea of filing a main request and auxiliary requests, I think, which are to be considered if the main request isn't found allowable. So yeah, you can do this during pre-grant examination. Um, you can put a, a main request to the examiner and some auxiliary requests. Um, it's quite unusual to do it in exam examination, but it is a possibility. Um, I wouldn't normally recommend it during examination, um, but it, you know, it can be done. Um, it, it's very important in opposition, however. So in opposition, um, as the patentee, you want to make sure that you have filed all the possible amendments as auxiliary requests that you might want to rely upon during the, the hearing um, and proceedings. And the reason for this is, is that um, the later you file claim amendments during EPO proceedings, the less likely the EPO is to let them in. So um, at an early stage, consider all the amendments you might want to file, um, work out which are so important you need to file immediately. And, and then you might perhaps want to keep a few on hold to finalise your position once you have the preliminary opinion of the opposition division prior to the hearing. But certainly it's, it's a crucial part of, of the proceedings and something you need to think about. Uh, we can take a couple of uh, verbal questions. Anybody wants to ask a question over the microphone? Uh, Rajkumar, Pushplata, uh, any of you want to ask a question? Yes, uh, I would like to ask one question. Uh, Christopher, it was a very nice session actually. We learned so much from this session. I would like to ask uh, two questions. First of all, in combination to the auxiliary request and main request, how many requests can be done by the applicant? Is there any limit for the request? And what is the main criteria for that uh, filing the request? So many requests. Second question, is the patent prosecution highway is acceptable by the EPO? What is the good suggestion for this filing through PPH highway? Yeah, I can deal with both of those. So there is no um, limit on the number of auxiliary requests you can file. Um, if you file requests with your response to the opposition, they will all automatically be admitted and um, should be considered in due course. Having said that, um, if you file huge numbers of requests, you know, 30 or something, um, then you will lose sympathy with the opposition division. And although they can't object in principle to you filing that many, um, it will probably annoy them. And so it's, it's not a good idea unless you really have to. Um, if you file lots of requests after your initial response to the opposition, um, then the EPO have discretion to, to not admit them. So if you file with your written submissions prior to the hearing, another 20 new requests, the EPO may well say, no, this is too many requests they're all late, you can only have five of them or something like that. So um, it depends the stage at which you're filing them. Um, in terms of what you need to think about when you're filing your requests, I would just say that um, make sure that you have requests that deal with each of the objections um, that have been raised by the opposition division and opponent um, so that you have somewhere to, to re retreat to if you lose on a particular point. Um, you may not need to make combinations of all of those features. You might be able to file that type of amendment during the hearing, but that's that's something to sort of plan ahead when you're preparing your submissions. Um, moving on to the second question about PPH. Yeah, I mean, the EPO is a signatory to the, the, the patent prosecution highway. Um, we don't generally recommend using it for two reasons. Um, first is that um, in practice, all you get from PPH is accelerated examination the EPO um, will re-examine the case itself. It won't just accept the uh, decisions by another patent office. Um, so all you really get is accelerated examination and you can get accelerated examination without paying a fee just by filing a request for acceleration. So in effect, the PPH doesn't really gain you much in procedurally at the EPO. Um, the other reason we generally recommend against it is um, you have to make your claims uh, exactly the same or substantially the same as, as, the, as the reference case. And having just explained um, all of the problems we have with added matter at the EPO, um, 
there is often a risk that the amendments you need to make to bring your claims into conformity with what's being granted elsewhere uh, add matter. So you'd be better off just um, pursuing a, a particular EPO strategy with a request for acceleration rather than going down the PPH route. Some other questions um, in similar lines or on any other aspect. Otherwise, I have a couple of questions in the chat that we can ask from there. But any quick questions, anybody? All right, Chris. So uh, there's a question from Vijay which says that for biologic drug patents, uh, patent rights of new indication, which is not mentioned in the granted patent, is allowed uh, now at this moment. Uh, or any ch are there any changes in the law regarding that? No, there's no changes in the law in that area at all at the moment. So um, you you can always in the EPO uh, get uh, patent protection for new uses of, of known compounds, um, provided that new use is not disclosed anywhere in, in the art. Um, so in that respect, we have quite a liberal system that's um, a lot easier, for example, than what you have in India, where new uses of known compounds aren't, aren't patentable. So we haven't had any changes in law there, and, and we don't envisage any anytime soon. I think Akshay's question um, has already been answered. You can always file a third party observation uh, during the pre-grant proceeding. Yeah, correct. I mean, I think it's, I, I didn't really touch upon that, but it is, it's an important point, which is that um, when you become aware of a third party patent application that you are concerned about, you, you do have two options and they're not mutually exclusive. So you, you may want to think about filing third party observations, or you may wish to kind of hold your ammunition um, until you can file an opposition and one of the reasons to not file third party observations although it's cheap is that it alerts the patent holder to the fact that you're concerned about something and they then may uh, file divisional applications and take all sorts of steps that they wouldn't do if you hadn't filed third party observations but the flip side of it is is that third party observations are cheap compared to an opposition and you may be able to prevent grants entirely by filing third party observations uh, particularly if you have a document that destroys the novelty of the claims so you've always got this um you've always got this decision this you've got to toss up what the best um option is for your particular set of facts and there may not be a right answer um but it's as long as you know all the sort of criteria you can you can think about it and come up with a good strategy oh, there's one more question in the chat uh, chris i don't know if you can take this right now uh, it talks about the dedication disclosure rule uh, that existed in europe and because of this uh, the effective uh, an efficient tool it was uh, in the defense toolbox are you aware of uh, this rule and maybe throw some light on it i have to say that's not something i'm particularly familiar with um no i can look into that and get back to you offline if that would be helpful so rajkumar you can perhaps uh, send an email to bhumika and then she can route that question to chris and uh, uh, write an email directly to him as well uh, um, uh, any other questions that anybody has you just probably can take another one last question. I think Chris, everything gets uh, probably gotten answered in that sense. So excellent. Good. Thanks uh, very much. It was a uh, sincere pleasure. It's uh, early morning for you. So um, uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, on, on a weekend and uh, look forward to stay in touch and Thank you very, very much for sparing your time and covering an elaborate um, spectrum of uh, aspects on European patent law. And look forward to staying in close touch and perhaps to uh, more of such events uh, as they really add a strong value to Chris. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that's, that's kind words. And um, thank you everybody for your, for your attention and also for the interesting questions. I, I hope it's been a useful session and um, do get in touch if there's anything else I can help out with. Very, very happy to provide advice. Absolutely. The session was recorded, so we'll share a copy uh, on YouTube and on um, other platforms as well. And thank you again, Chris, and see you soon. Thank you, everybody, Great. for joining in. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Yeah, bye-bye.